investors and corporations in our network. Uh, we have been able to build the largest corporate innovation platform uh, with around 400 corporations uh, in 30 plus locations around the world. And we make about uh, 150, 200 investments every year. Our uh, check size is very small. So we invest anywhere between 50,000 up to half a million dollars. And when we invest in the companies, we take one to 5% equity. And over the past couple of decades, we have invested in about a thousand companies, uh, 550 of which are actively growing uh, their businesses globally. And uh, our practice in the energy program focuses on the energy industry value chain, working with large corporations in the oil and gas and electric utility industry. And we invest in technologies that build the future of the energy space and uh, the future of low carbon economy a decentralized and deregulated uh, and uh, decarbonized energy sector. So that's like on a high level what we do. Uh, we are based in Silicon Valley uh, and we have branched out our practice in, in Houston, in China, in Europe, and uh, in the next month or two, we're going to launch in Japan as well. Uh, COVID has changed a lot of things uh, in our ecosystem. Obviously, uh, the number of COVID cases has surpassed $5 million, in the 5 million people in the U.S. And we uh, currently um, have seen some of our industry-specific verticals have uh, faced significant challenges. However, uh, we have been able to, both on the corporate side as well as startups, uh, bring on new companies on board. Uh, on the startup side, we invested in 74 companies so far. About 39 of those investments are in new companies. So we are actively meeting with founders uh, and kind of conducting due diligence and evaluate potential investment opportunities. And on the corporate side, we've been able to bring on some, some of the largest uh, brands in the world to, to join plug and play uh, during COVID. So these are companies like Microsoft, like Savic and like Loop Resolve and uh, some of the other major brands like Nike, McDonald's, Cargill, and, and Facebook and British Telecom. So that goes to show that, you know, the need to innovate on the corporation side is felt more than before. And the innovation as it relates to some of their top pain points and priorities remains to be a, you know, a part of their agenda. Um, obviously disproportionately depending on what sector you're in and energy is one of those sectors that is facing challenges, especially on the oil and gas side. So, I want to keep the introduction short. Uh, we have about 23 uh, attendees. Today's session is obviously for uh, Roger and Brian to talk about the data analytics and big data science that they use. Um, we are happy to take some of your questions. If you would like to ask any questions, feel free to drop a note here in the chat box. Happy to share them uh, with the broader audience today. If not, uh, we can turn it over to you, Raju, and this, the floor is yours for the next hour. Okay, thanks, Smith. Thanks for the brief introduction for Plug and Play, but I'm sure many of them already know it. Uh, and it's a pleasure to be part of this conversation. So thank you, everyone, for joining this session. My name is Raju. We'll be doing a quick introduction. I think we have uh, 23 folks, so I would not take much time from each of you. Uh, would have been great to really interact with the individual but I think uh, for interest of time, what we're going to do a request is while we are doing quick introductions, if you may quickly put on chat, just briefly two things, uh, who you are, uh, your name, role and company, and one main reason, what's the key reason which you joined the session, that would be very helpful if you could do that and appreciate uh, if you can do that while we quickly go through the introduction. So we, as part of Big Data Trunk, I'm going to briefly talk about our company, uh, we headquartered based in Bay Area, Fremont, California, centrally there, have offshore development centers back in India. As a company, we do three things. We have consulting practices around data and some of the cutting edge technology areas. We also do corporate trainings to prestigious uh, universities like Stanford and Fortune 500 companies. We also do, do develop products for ourselves and our clients as well. Uh, we focus mostly, as I said, in data analytics, of course, AI, data science, and that's our forte, uh, big data, Hadoop, Apache, but we also support 
in other technologies like blockchain, AR, VR, IoT to in terms of trainings or in terms of corporate practices, consultings or advisory services. Uh, we are technology partner to pretty much all the three big corp uh, giants, where we, it is uh, Google, Amazon, Microsoft uh, in the cloud space. And these are a few of our clients just uh, covering one of them in pretty much a, one area uh, with education, Stanford, healthcare, USG, most of the top leaders in their industry, financial, tech, uh, and so on and so forth. And of course, pg &E from the uh, energy sector side of things. That's a brief about us. Uh, I'm not going to go over this, but this is our training offering. It's actually a subset of that. We have 70 plus trainings uh, provided in different landscapes and I'm going to not stay there. Uh, these are some of our clients which we are proud to help in some form or shape, uh, as I said, spreading to our different journey. Um, briefly about myself, my name is Raju Srivastava. Blessed to be part of the data analytic industry for 22 years. It never subsides. Data's demand, I think it's an evergreen field. Uh, I'm the co-founder of Big Data Trunk located um, in Fremont and have presented in several conferences. Some of these are right here. I've been also been fortunate to be an author of two different books uh, on for Pearson Publication and Microsoft Press, both related to how we can take big data uh, or data into the high level enterprise, high availability and enterprise level. Uh, all of that is available, love to really interact with folks. So while we are doing, I think some people have already started sharing their introduction, Henry, Jenny, thank you very much. If you can share your introduction, that would save us some time and we can get to the session as quickly as possible. The main uh, person in the session and the main presenter for today is Anthony, who is our chief data scientist. Uh, he's not only passionate about data and AI, but it's literally obsessed. I think there are days and nights and he forgets the time and just keeps on working on amazing, amazing stuff. He has done a lot of different data sets, uh, um, worked on unstructured images, text, and of course, but his speciality lies in audio data, which he has done some deep, deep research in that area. Quite humble and sharing in their presentations, a known name, uh, Anthony, who is with us. So I'm going to share the floor with Anthony and pass the ball to you. I'm going to stop sharing, and Anthony, whenever you're ready, you can share and get started. So thank you. And meanwhile, folks, uh, if you all can um, put your introduction in the chat, that would help. We are monitoring the chat and we can answer any questions which come via chat and so on and so forth as well. Um, so we can see your screen, Anthony. Yep, perfect. Thank you, Dinesh. Okay, welcome everyone. Just give me a second, I'm just trying to get uh everything we set up here uh, at, the, at the moment everybody's on mute by default and please keep it keep it so but if you have any questions at later stages when we open up we can mute and ask questions or feel free to put your questions in the chat as well okay you guys we're going to get started here again my name is uh anthony ross and and as, as was mentioned Feel free to uh, you know ask questions if you need to. I'm going to assume that you don't know anything. I know we have a lot of students and people who are are uh, new to the field, so I'm going to try to stay very high level in general. But I do want to give you some sense of um, just some use cases how data science is used in the energy uh, industry, and I'll be talking a lot about um, data science, machine learning, AI, and how it's used to uh, I guess, uh, manage risk and improve performance. And, and I'll just be, like I said, discussing just a few use cases. And so I'm gonna try to uh, give us maybe 10, 10, 15 minutes or so at the end uh, for questions or anything that you guys may want to. But in the meantime, if you'd like to feel free to interject or uh, put something into the chat. And, and uh, I'm sure Raju, uh, as well as myself, as I'm able, we'll keep our eye on the chat and uh, we'll respond as appropriate, okay? So let's get started here. Uh, first of all, um, I want to talk a lot. I mentioned uh, machine learning, deep learning, and AI. And so I just want to clarify that for, for, again, I'm going to assume that you don't know anything. And so let's just talk a little bit about that. When we talk about artificial intelligence, uh, we're talking about um, machines that exhibit behavior that we associate with human behavior. And so AI is kind of this large field. Uh, so people will talk about AI, but I want to, to uh, clarify that machine learning is a type of AI. 
So when you hear uh, uh, AI, machine learning, a lot of times these things are used interchangeably, but artificial intelligence has some other areas uh, of, uh, in addition to just machine learning, but a good portion of it is machine learning. And then further, sometimes you'll hear the term deep learning, and deep learning is a type of machine learning. And so just to give you some sense of the hierarchy, you have artificial intelligence, and then machine learning is kind of a subfield of that, and then deep learning. But most of the time when you hear artificial intelligence, uh, we're thinking deep learning most of the time. But most of the things that we associate with artificial intelligence, such as voice or computer vision, all those are, are, are probably more associated with deep learning. Uh, but I'll differentiate those a little bit again, but I'm going to try to stay high level because I, I know there are a lot of people who may not have a, much of a background in, in, in data. Okay, so um, I want to give you guys a little intuition about, um, about data science or, or about more so about machine learning. So I want to talk a little bit about that, just give you guys some background. So if you don't know much about machine learning uh, and maybe differentiate a little bit from just analytics to give you some sense, this will help kind of as we give examples perhaps. At least you'll be familiar, maybe be conversant with the term and kind of know what machine learning is. Um, and so first of all, let me give you some examples. Uh, with traditional software development, I'd like to just make it clear for people, with traditional software development, um, if you're going to write an app or something, like converting inches to centimeters, if that's what you wanted to do, then typically what you would need to do is you would need to uh, tell the app. The app doesn't know anything. The app is done. The machine is done. doesn't know anything other than what you tell it. So the first thing you need to identify are the inputs and the outputs. Okay. So in this case, you'd have inches are the inputs. And then you'd have to know, you have to tell the machine what's the relationship between inches and centimeters. The machine doesn't know that. So you're going to have to tell the machine. And we happen to know that inches times 2.54 centimeters. So you would tell the machine that, hey, you're going to get this input. You're going to multiply by 2.54, then you want to return that value. And the machine will do that, and it happens to be centimeters. The machine doesn't know what centimeters, doesn't even know what inches are, but the machine will do as you've asked. But you're going to have to tell it the relationship between inches and centimeters. Okay, so as another example, if you want to convert a number to its absolute value, you're going to have to, again, know what the inputs and the outputs are. So in this case, you're going to say there's going to be a number. That's going to be my input is some number. And in this case, there's probably going to be rules. Sometimes it's rules that you have to tell the machine. And so for this case, you might say, if the number is greater than or equal to zero, then the absolute value is that number. Otherwise, the absolute value is that number times negative one. So we have to tell the machine these rules in order for it to do what we need to do, because the machine doesn't know anything except what we tell it. And if, we, and if our rules are correct, then it will give us the absolute value. Okay, so that's, what tr that's traditionally what we would do, how we would write software, how a machine would do things traditionally is by us telling it what to do. But let me give you guys a different example here. Let's say that you uh, in, uh, have this wind farm. And instead of manually inspecting the farm or the turbines, um, you know, for maintenance or damage, you decide that you would like to, um, you'd like for a drone to inspect it. So you'd like to have some drone fly over and you want it to inspect these turbines for damage or maintenance or, or failure or anything else, you'd like for it to, to, that's what you'd like for it to do. So here's what I want you to think about uh, from the traditional software development point of view. How do you teach a drone? How does a drone, what rules do you tell it? What, what rules can you communicate to a drone or to a machine? How to tell the difference between a healthy or a good uh, turbine and a damaged one? What are the rules that you would write? And there, there's different things you may think about because this is kind of black, but that may not always be the case. Sometimes it could be broken where you only have two blades. That could be a rule, but that's not going to always be true. So you have to have all these rules that you would write. And if you could write these rules, what you might do is take some images and then you'd say, here are my rules to tell the difference between a, you know, a, a, a good blade, I mean, a, a good turbine and a damaged turbine. So you'd have these rules you'd write, if this, then that, if not this, then, not, then, then that. But you're going to have all of these corner cases, and you're going to probably have a lot of error. But if you could do well, it would probably output that you, this is a good blade and this one is a damaged blade. Okay? Those are tough problems. And usually with machine learning, unless the solution is transparent and just very clear, it's better to let a machine do it. And we'll talk a little bit about that and how we do that. So let me give you guys an example. I want you guys to think about this. You know, just think about this in your head, how, we, how you would do this. So let's say that you're given some input. Okay, you're given some numbers. You're, you're like the machine. You're given, just think about this on your own. I'm sure many of you, if not all of you, are very bright and, and might be able to solve this. I'm going to give you maybe 45 seconds. But I want you to look at these numbers. You have 144, 181, 200, 317, and 800. Okay, that's the input. And then the associated output 
are these numbers. Now I want you guys just to briefly see if you can look at these numbers and determine what the, what the relationship is. And, and in terms of machine learning, what the function is. That's what machine learning is trying to do. What's the unknown function here? Can you look at these numbers, determine if I were to give you another number, what would the output be? I'm going to give you about another 20 seconds. See if you can look at this and determine what the output might be if I were to give you another number. What's the relationship? Uh, 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 these numbers? Mm -hmm. Go ahead, say it. Speak up. Yes, so that is uh, the output is 400 minus the input. Excellent. 400 minus the input. Well done. And the reason I had you guys do that, I didn't expect anyone to get it. I'm glad you did. Maybe many of you did. Is, I mean, once you see it, you see it. But the reason I wanted you guys to do that, you guys, is that is how machines learn. That is exactly how machines learn. Machines say, you give me the input, you give me the output, let me learn the relationship. You can't tell me how to recognize a face. You can't tell me how to recognize, you, there's not enough rules to tell me how to recognize a, a damaged uh, a turbine, wind turbine. You can't tell me that. You can't tell me there's not enough rules. There's too many exceptions. You just can't do it. So the best thing for you to do is to give me an example of the input, give me an example of the output, and let me learn it on my own. Let me learn it. And so, for example, with machine learning, what you would do, you'd give it these numbers. I'm not sure who just answered, but just like he did, you'd take some numbers like this, and then instead of giving it the relationship like you would do with software, you're going to give it the output. You're going to give it an answer key. I'm going to say, here's the answer. When you see this number, here's the answer you need to give me. I'm not, I don't know why. You figure it out. I don't know why this is, 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 is a damaged uh, turbine and this is, or why this is my face and that's your face, or why this is a cat and that's a dog. I can't tell you the rules. All I can do is give you examples. You figure out the relationship. And so that's what machines will do. Machines say, give me examples. Let me figure out the relationship. And how that is done? about these common machine learning algorithms. These are just some of the common ones. This is for traditional machine learning, structured data, which we'll talk a little bit about. And then there's other ones for deep learning, which is more of the AI type of stuff. But that's what we do. We give it some machine learning algorithm that sits in the middle and it learns a relationship or this unknown function. There's some function that, that, that allows you to unlock your phone and only you, of the billions of people in the world, only you can unlock your phone. There's some function, that, that is, there, there's some model that, that knows that, or on Facebook for any of you. And this is what it is. It sits in the middle and it says, I think I figured it out. It's 400 minus the input is what just was said. And once it does that, it, it learns that unknown function. We call that a model. It's a model. So when you hear the term machine learning model, that's all a model is. Usually it's a black box where you can't see inside of it depending on the algorithm, but most of them are black boxes. It just does a good job. So that is a model right there. So now we have this machine learning model and you give it new input, and if you trained it well, it should give you accurate output. So you don't have to do the relationship thing anymore. What you have to do is, do I have examples of my problem? Can I collect examples of the problem? Because machines, these algorithms you guys are telling you today are so good. We have infinite compute. We have infinite storage. It's about data. Can you get the data? Can you get the examples of the problem for the model so that it can learn this unknown function? And so the problem that we would do with this drone, if we wanted to recognize damage and, and healthy or good, um, turbines, we're going to give it as many pictures as we can find. I mean, as many as we can find, behind, forward, dim light, cloudy, bright, whatever we can do, we're going to give it as many as, uh, images as we can. And then we want to give it labels. We want to give the answer key. This is the answer. I can't tell you why this is good. I can't tell you why this one's damaged, why this is damaged. I, don't, I can't tell you the rules. I know it when I see it, but I can't tell you the rules. There's too many things. I haven't seen every turbine in the world. I have no idea. Some could be damaged. I just haven't seen it. So I can't tell you the rules. But I can give you a bunch of images and you can learn the rules on your own. And that's what machines will do. And we call these labels. And these labels are the answer key. This is what we also call supervised learning because it supervises the learning. So when the, if the machine were to predict damage here, it has to go back and say, I have to change my internal parameters, usually with neural networks, and we call those weights or coefficients. It's going to change those until, until it can minimize its error. And then it'll say, I think I've solved it. I think I've learned this unknown function that allows me to tell when something's damaged and when it's not. Okay. And so again, we have this algorithm that sits in the middle. And it's going to do its best based on what you've given it, the examples you've given it. It's going to work hard for you to try to learn this model. And now once it has this trained model, it's this model that has all the information about the relationship between the input and the output. Whatever the relationship is, it's saying, I think I figured it out. I've solved it. My error is pretty small, at least up to your satisfaction. You're, you're going to be the judge on what, on what is a successful model. 
that is I think I've, I have it. And so we have this model, it's a thing. We put it on a thumb drive, put it on a server, put it on a mobile device, it's a thing. It's a real thing that understands that, it doesn't understand anything else, but it understands healthy and broken turbines. That's what it understands. It doesn't understand your face. It doesn't understand traffic lights or, or self-driving cars or anything else. Serving ads to something doesn't understand anything about that, but it understands this problem very well. And that's what it does. So now we have this model and you give it a new image that it's never seen before and it should out if you train it well, that's the image. I have to, I don't, I have to trust it. You just have to trust it. Of course, we can see it, but there may be a time where you don't know, especially if it's a drone, it's way up there. You're not going up there. Uh, you don't want to take the time or the risk maybe to go up and look at, at, at your uh, turbines. So you have a drone, drone drones. You have to trust that the model is good. If you trained it well, that you'd be able to learn. You don't, you don't know how it's doing it, just like you don't know, uh, you, you know, in other words, you can't write the rules to do it, let it do it on its own and then trust it if you've trained it well and have gathered the data. So, the main thing I want you to take from that is that instead of programming a computer, this is so useful to understand, especially today uh, with data everywhere. Instead of programming a computer, you give a computer examples and it learns what you want, which is so important to understand that machines learn by example. And so your task is to get examples. I don't care what the problem is. Your task is to get examples and ideally labeled examples. In other words, examples where you know this is this and this is that, this is this, this is that. You figure out why I've labeled them that way. Whatever the expert is, if it's recognizing uh, bacterial pneumonia in, in, in a chest scan or whether it's recognized, whatever it might be, an expert is going to label it or whatever to say this is damaged, this isn't damaged. People may disagree, but whatever it is, whatever you've trained it on, it should know that well. Okay? So now, um, as all of you guys know, data is everywhere and just about everything is connected to the internet. And I mentioned that because this is so useful in energy, this, this uh, what, what's called internet of things is where everything is interconnected or has the ability to be interconnected. Just about everything can communicate two way. Just about everything can connect to just about anything else. And, and so that's so important. But uh, the energy industry is a particular interesting market or use case for the internet of things so useful today with, with the internet of things. So I, want, I really want to emphasize that. And it's really, it can be true for a lot of other areas, but for energy, it's very useful to, to understand this, this internet of things. Um, mainly with the increased usage of, of these sensor devices and network communication or Wi-Fi and cloud computing, there's just an extensive amount of data available, uh, you know, in the energy or electricity sector, just so much data that's available. But for this internet of things, it's also called IoT. So I'll mention that sometimes just because it's a little bit shorter. You'll see that sometimes. And that's the internet of things where all these things are connected and there's just infinite data out there just constantly being connected where models are constantly learning. You know, it's not, it's not just it learns once and then that's it because data changes. It's fluid, things change. Uh, the weather changes. Uh, a lot of things may change where you need more information in terms of, of, of how you're gonna serve, how you're gonna distribute. Uh, uh, energy and all these different things need to be learned oftentimes constantly. And so um, just really quick regarding upstream uh, management and some of those things, uh, so much work has been focused on improving, uh, uh, you know, the maintenance and, and the monitoring of, of these, these, these big machines, this equipment, whether it's for fracking or, or, or anything else, but, but the maintenance of these machines and understanding a failure and, 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 and having, um, Sensors that can constantly monitor these things today, just outstanding what we can do. The same thing here when, with the, the Internet of Things, even though this is way out there in the middle of nowhere regarding drilling or whatever it might be, the, the, the potential failure points, whatever those are, uh, can be equipped with a variety of sensors, whether it's pressure or uh, temperature, torque, vibration, flow, all these different things that you may want to measure. You can do that constantly. Uh, with the Internet of Things, you know, you have oil and gas companies can utilize, uh, you know, the, the, the IoT to monitor the, the um, health of their equipment, whether it's for exploration or development or drilling or whatever it, it might be. So uh, uh, oil and gas companies can leverage the Internet of Things and data science to predict the maintenance of an asset, maybe even more importantly, to identify assets that are most likely to fail. That's what's crucial because, you know, you, you, you can have... Uh, reduce downtimes and, and maintenance costs and all these other things. But a lot of this is because of, of, of the volume of data 
and the constancy of data, especially with Internet of Things, where everything's connected and everything can communicate with everything else. It's not just one way anymore. And that's what's so powerful using data science and machine learning and AI. And so uh, additionally, bring it back a little bit, is that uh, a lot of oil and gas companies have started installing sensors within their wells, you know, in order to estimate a machine's, uh, you know, efficiency of machines' um, utilization and operational efficiency. Uh, you know, a lot of these uh, sensors can analyze how well is, um, maybe how it's performing, how it's doing, how much oil or gas is still left, whatever you might want to do, but all these things can have sensors. And again, the thing that's great about these sensors is they're not one way. They can be multiple ways. They can communicate with each other. They can communicate with the grid. They can communicate in so many different ways. So it's important to grasp this internet of things today and how valuable that can be to understand, especially um, if you can have um, appropriate machine learning, constantly learning from all of this data. Now, having said all of that, you guys, the biggest beneficiary of all of this, of all this uh, Internet of Things talk is probably the smart grid. Probably the biggest thing, because it has to pull all of this together. You know, it's, in fact, you, it, you um, the smart grid probably couldn't even, wouldn't be effective at all without IoT today. It just wouldn't be a thing without it, you know, because all of the shift is towards more sensors and more sensors and more sensors in, in, in energy facilities, just more read, readings and more sensors in just about everything. And so IoT automates the monitoring of, of um, each device on your network, whatever it is, local or, or, or whatever it might be, but every device in the network is monitored and it provides just an access to a wealth of information which is why data science and machine learning is so important here. It's not just getting the information, I mean, getting the data, that's a big part of it, but it's the data science and machine learning that uniquely can take this volume of data and constantly learn from, which is a little bit different from just uh, analytics. Um, and so here are a lot of the sources of data, all these different things that you're pulling in. You know, IoT provides access to, to um, you know, power production and, and storage, transmission, distribution, consumption, all these different things, you have structured data. And when I say structured data, structured data is data that you would have like in an Excel spreadsheet. Something that's tabular that has rows and columns, that would be structured data typically. You have semi-structured data, you have un uh, unstructured data, and, and we'll talk a little bit about unstructured data, but that's data that would be the opposite, wouldn't easily fit into uh, a table. You know, voice and music and text and, and uh, images and video, those types of things would be more unstructured. Okay. Um, uh, because there's so much data that you're getting all the time, especially with the internet, or doing mining the grid involves so much uh, data that machine learning is used, usually in real time in the cloud, to provide the analytics. I mean, literally in real time. A lot of this is taken, put in the cloud, taken, put in the cloud, and it's constantly, it's what's called online learning, it's constantly being learned and trained from. And there's just such a volume uh, of data. Uh, as I said, whether it has to do with upstream, whether it's local, whether it's all of these, these little internet of things, sensors all over the place, there's so much volume of data. And as I said, it's not just one way, it's multi-way communication. And um, so this smart grid that we've talked about has to coordinate all of this internet of things, has to coordinate all of this in some way. And, and a big part of the smart grid, the big driving force, a big push today, not just the United States, but throughout the world, is uh, you know uh, the the uh, utilization of renewables you know whether it's wind and solar so a lot of it is trying to look at the ability to to uh, favor if I can say renewables over any other type of uh, energy and that can be difficult because renewables can be unpredictable it has to do with weather and time of day and uh, temperature and so many other things that, that whether the sun's out and location, geography, so many other things can affect renewables. And so that has to be monitored. And so that when you can use it, use it. And, and as opposed to, you know, as opposed to, um, in other words, you can make some choices here and, and it can be fluid. And, and so that's such a big part of this, especially with the smart grid. It has so much information coming in. And then just like this with wind farms and solar farms, they're constantly generating large amounts of data which can influence the smart grid's behavior because this is a big part of what one is to reduce uh, CO2 emissions and try to uh, use renewables. Um, um, and as I said, by taking in all this data machine learning can enable greater allocation to wind and solar uh, sources, uh, again, to reduce, uh, you know, just uh, environmental impacts. Now, uh, additionally, in, in terms of all of that, here's where it's really taken off, and that is uh, the smart grid can utilize millions of local IoT devices, you know, when we're talking about these smart connected homes where everything's connected. 
and it can improve the efficiency of energy use because there's two-way communication. There's communication with the customer, there's communication with the grid. It's, it's, it's back and forth, it's local, and it's also at the grid level. And so you have all of these, these um, connected devices, whether it's a refrigerator, a coffee pot, a, a, uh, the um, air conditioner, and, and just everything, lights that can communicate with each other, and washing machines and dryers being, uh, can be communicated to say, you know, maybe the dryer comes on at three in the morning as opposed to during peak time. All of this can be communicated based on what else is being used. If not a lot is being used and energy use is low or, or it's cool outside, then certain things can happen uh, because of these, uh, the smart grid. All these things can communicate with each other and make certain um, efficient uh, decisions in terms of energy use. Um, also, uh, in this smart grid, smart meters uh, help uh, to collect and transmit this data. You know, at least as far as PG&E, a lot of the smart meters are things that can collect all of these, this disparate data, collect it, transmit it to the cloud, and the machine learning uh, in real time can analyze this and process it and, and, and uh, generate some insights and influence behavior um, uh, in real time well, as all of this is collected and sent to the cloud. Now, a couple of other things that I think are really useful here is that machine learning is used, and I think this is, 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 is very uh, uh, useful and interesting that machine learning is used to help the grid to self-heal. I think that's so useful today uh, uh, um, in terms of self-healing. And what I mean by that, it allows, it's smart enough to, to self-restore. If, if, uh, you know, if, if there's some fault or something goes out, then it can reroute around that. In other words, if something goes out, the model can identify where that fault is and perform switching in real time. You know, so it can restore uh, power automatically. I think that's excellent uh, uh, use of the technology and in terms of IoT and communication and all the data. And it's also great uh, naturally for um, um, customer satisfaction, uh, where instead of doing it manually, uh, having a machine do it, uh, where power, if, if it does go out at all, then it can be turned on relatively quickly as opposed to having to be done manually. Uh, we can have all these things that are monitoring the system and can kind of respond in real time. Okay. Um, and so just to bring all of this together as far as a smart grid and IoT is such a big part about this, it's kind of the center of, of, of this world right here. And that is that um, for utilities, the internet of things and cloud computing and smart metering and all these things that we've talked about are all used with machine learning to help um, produce energy and to more efficiently use energy or to distribute energy as, we, as we've talked about, okay? Now to shift gears a little bit from that, so I want to give you guys a good variety of some of these things. Again, I don't know how familiar you are with, with some of these technologies, but I hope to excite you about some of the things that you can do today. Data, 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 you guys, whoever has the most data wins. It's just so important if you can get the data because the technology is there, with GPUs and the chips and cloud and all that, it is about data. And, and so a few other things I want to show you about, I'll talk to you guys a little bit about data centers. You may say, well, that's kind of weird about data centers. And the reason I mentioned data centers, you guys, is that energy consumption by data centers has become a big issue in the tech industry. In fact, I think in the United States, 2% of all the energy used in the United States from these data centers, these, these, which are spread all over the world, but from, from these data centers. And, uh, and a lot of it is due to the, the world's increased uh, need for computing power. Just ravenous, all the things that we're doing, everything's connected, everything's data, uh, uh, constantly a great use of, of data. But interestingly, you guys, Google, who's a, uh, one, is, is a cloud provider for one, but interesting, Google trained an AI, you guys, to learn how to manage the cooling of its data centers in order to lower power consumption. I think that's brilliant. I think that's incredible. Because they used to do it manually, AI would kind of help, but AI was able to do some things uniquely that now AI can do it by itself. Now, a human can take over if it needs to, if it looks like there's something that's being a little risky, but it, it uniquely can do it by itself. And, and uh, part of this is that one of the primary sources of energy use, as you guys I'm sure know in Google's data center, is the cooling of servers that are powering search and Gmail and YouTube and all these different things. So it's a big deal uh, at, um, at Google. Uh, but the way it works though, which is interesting, is that every five minutes, you guys, every five minutes this trained AI that's still learning, it's constantly learning, but every five minutes, the AI predicts how uh, different combinations of potential actions will affect energy consumption. So talking about all these, these, these billions of combinations of actions that it's considering, and it looks at its confidence level, and if it has low confidence, it gets rid of the choice. And, but it's learned, it's learned uh, which actions will minimize uh, energy uh, uh, consumption. 
and it has been able to, uh, I believe, achieve about a 40% um, reduction in the amount of energy uh, used uh, for cooling. The data center, which has been very successful, and again, it, it operates completely by itself. And it's learned, just like I said, by example. It learns by, by initially by, by acting and by doing and seeing what certain, because again, machines can do billions of calculations that we just can't do. And so here's an um, example that you can see. This is the, 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 the power uses. And power use effectiveness just means uh, how much is the data center using, or is, is IT using versus the whole data center. And so that's what it was trying to, that's, that's what it was trying to measure. And you can see here that um, what its normal level is, and you can see when machine learning was turned on, and then you can see again when machine learning was turned off. And so, and, and it continues to, to do its thing now and it continues to learn. Here's what I want to show you, which is very interesting to me. And that is that um, the, uh, if you look here at this chart, the blue line is data as it, got, as it gets more. And this is what's unique, you guys, about deep learning. Traditional machine learning isn't always like this. It oftentimes levels off like it's not sure what to do with all that data, but deep learning doesn't do that. The AI, it can just go as it gets more and more data. You can see as it got more and more data over time, it gets more efficient and more efficient and more efficient. And I think that's brilliant. In fact, it's interesting that Google commented, kind of like I was saying earlier about rules versus AI, letting machine learning. Google commented at the time is that rules don't get better over time, but AI does. And I think, I think that's a brilliant way to put it. AI will constantly learn. You give it more data, it's going to continue to learn where rules wouldn't. If you're going to write rules and you could write rules, they're not going to get better with time than AI can. And so it's important to keep that in mind as you're doing machine learning and training some of these things. If you get enough data and you train your model well, it can continue to learn. And that's why, again, when I mentioned the, uh, the internet of things, you have this data that's constantly streaming and constantly being collected in the cloud. So you have machine learning constantly learning from and hopefully getting better and better and learning better and getting more efficient. Okay. A few other things here, because uh, I want to be mindful of the time. Um, I want to talk a little bit about unstructured data. And with unstructured data, again, we're talking about text and chatbots and images and all these other things. But I want to spend a little time with chat, because I think chat is, is such a useful thing to do. I don't know if you guys have, have, are as familiar with chat, but chat today can be brilliant, you guys, mainly because of, of uh, this natural language processing. Some of these technologies have gotten so good. I won't talk about the different algorithms, some of the changes. But some of these things have gotten really good today, and, and it has made it uh, easier for utility companies, in particular, since we're talking about energy, to provide more interactive customer service uh, via voice or chat uh, using natural language processing. And so, for example, if you wanted to do chat, you could type in some message, for example, you know, just to, to an energy company or anyone. I can ask you a question about my bill. You could train any, any chat bot. It can respond professionally. It can respond colloquially. Like say, yes, what's up? However you want, it can train, it can, but it can know that area so well. If it's narrow, chat bots can be so good. If it's very narrow, chat bots can be really good. So for example, I just want to quickly talk about this because I think this is, this is one of the things that's changed a lot. It's called Beam Search to show you how some of this is done really quick. Uh, with Beam Search, for example, normally you get like 10 choices of words. I'm just going to show you two, but imagine how exponential this would be if you had 10 words. So the first thing the algorithm will do, what are the two best words, whatever question or statement, and I need to respond, what are the two best words that I can come up with? And it'll do that. Then each one of those two will get two choices. And then the algorithm says, what are the, looking at probability, what are the two best words that I can put together? Then it'll look at that. Then those get two choices. And I'll say, what are the two best from there? And it'll continue to do that until it gets to the very end and it will make a decision. It will say, oh, that's what I'm gonna respond. I'm glad that I could help. And it's so wonderful with this algorithm, how it does this. It gives you all, and again, I'm talking about, if you, what if you had 10 choices? You say how exponential, this is done instantly, but how chat can be so good and so natural, especially if it's really narrow. And so the example I'm giving you is this. Uh, Shell has their uh, uh, AI virtual assistant, which is Loop Chat, which I think is uh, a great use of this uh, because it's, cause it's narrow. It's an interactive chatbot where ca customers can ask any technical qu question relating to uh, Shell's lubricants. I think that's a perfect use of a chatbot because as I said, chatbots, I don't know if you've ever spoken to a company like your cable company or whatever. If you've ever chatted, you probably have no idea that it's a machine. And there may be five, there may be one person on five or six chats. And if the machine gets hung up on something, then, then a human can step in. But chat can be so good if it's narrow. Now, if you ask it about the weather or uh, directions, it, it, it wouldn't know. But if it's very narrow about things like this, it's a great use case of using AI. And for um, 
In this case with Shell, again, with natural language processing, it's very similar to a live conversation, except it's AI uh, holding the conversation. And naturally, uh, Shell calls uh, their Shelly. And with this, again, you can ask just about anything having to do with a lubricant, and it can respond. And I think this device can respond very naturally, and I just think that's a great use today of um, using AI in some of these ways as far as customers. Again, if you have some area that's really narrow that you can train uh, a chat bot or something to do, the natural language processing is really good for that. A um, Couple more things. One is computer vision, as we're talking about uh, um, unstructured data. This is really an actual used, uh, uh, drones are actually used to inspect wind turbines. And so this is computer vision. And what these drones do uh, is they go up and uh, they're trained deep learning to automatically identify defects and to predict failures. Just like we said, it trained on thousands of images to recognize failures, literally using computer vision. But another thing that's useful for these is that they're also trained to estimate angular velocity a rotational velocity so that you can get a sense of energy production for a wind farm. How fast are these things going? So we can do all of that. And I think that's interesting. The way the algorithm is, is computer vision is it first has to locate the hub. It's the first thing that it has to do. Where's the hub? You get some sense of direction. Where's the hub? So that's what it has to do. It has the first find. You can see where it's training, trying to find out where the hub of this turbine is. That's what it has to do first. And as hopefully you guys know, the way it does that is you're going to train it on a bunch of images. You can't write rules to do that. You can give it a bunch of images of hubs, and in turn, you can give it a bunch of images of blades, because that's because that's the second thing it does. The first thing it's going to do, and these would be thousands of images. Uh, the first thing it's going to do, it has to locate the hub, and once it locates the hub, the second thing it has to do is is determine whether there's a blade or not in the image, and if it does that, because it's video, it will it will. Uh, uh, train on a few of those frames in a row. So a few frames, because the reason it needs to look at several frames so it can get some sense of the angular velocity. So that in addition to looking for damage, you can also get some sense of um, power, uh, power production. And so this AI system can perform both predictive maintenance and energy production for wind farms. And that's using AI computer vision, as we talked about being trained. Uh, and both of them are using computer vision, but using them differently. And while it's up there, that's brilliant. Why not look for damage, but also uh, learn what the energy production is for the wind farm? And I think that's great to, to identify some of those things remotely to be able to do that. And then finally, let me give you guys one more example, because again, I want to leave, uh, uh, like I said, maybe uh, we're going to be under 15 minutes, maybe 10 minutes at the end. So I'll give you guys one more example, then I'll open it up for any uh, conversations that you guys, uh, any questions that you may have. So this next one is Deep Solar. And Deep Solar is a project actually uh, out of Stanford, and I think is another brilliant uh, uh, use of, of, of data science and machine learning. And that is, as we move uh, you know, toward these renewables, as I've talked about, uh, we talked about uh, wind, but also in this case, solar, it's useful to know who has solar panels. And that was never determined before. Who has solar panels, whether it's on their roof or in their backyard or in, for a neighborhood or whatever it might be? Who has these installations? How can we tell? And if you look here, can you tell where installations are, and that's never been done, to know the use of solar and the density of solar. And so you can tell, uh, you can look here and see, but fortunately, guys, solar panels generally work best when exposed to light. And so uh, they can, they're easy to spot uh, uh, from orbit. So from, in other words, from satellite images. And so this is the project that Stanford uh, uh, did, and I think it's just brilliant. And that is, um, uh, it uses deep learning to analyze these satellite images. And it uses them to identify a few things. One, it uses it to identify the GPS location so we know where these solar panels are. And secondly, we want to know the size of them. So it has to do two different things. It has to have a classifier to say, is there a solar, like we did earlier with damage? Same thing, it has to be trained on how in the world do you teach a model to recognize a solar panel? How do you tell, you couldn't write that. So, you have, so it has to be trained to recognize a solar panel for one. But then once it recognizes a solar panel, how can it determine the size of the area of that solar panel? That's what this project is doing. It's mapping every solar panel in the country to collect solar installation information or density information. And so as you, as you can see here, the darker blue colors are, are, in, in the, are for the states. So the darker the color, the more density, and that would make sense. You have California and Florida, a lot of sun, so that would make sense for perhaps solar panels, not so much as you move north. And as you get into the green, that has to do with counties. So the darker green, you can see LA and maybe up in the, I don't know if that's Santa Clara, San Francisco area-ish would be in California, would be a lot of the density. And then you get out here to these uh, uh, 
these neighborhood, these tracks that you would have, these census tracks that you have as you get in the darker the purple, the more. So they can go as far down, and there's so much more I won't get into that they've learned from how much money people make and, and so many different things that they've associated with, with these things that I won't, that's not as important for our purposes, but it's a very interesting project. And so you can see here again, you can see the densities, you know, in, in, in all of these. But the point is that I want you to see is this. For example, uh, this is, uh, would be an image. And this image would be fed into a convolutional neural network. Don't worry about this. But this is, is where, partly where deep learning comes from. As you have all of these layers uh, are, are uh, is considered a deep neural network as opposed to a shallow neural network as you get more, more layers. And so that's partially where deep learning comes from, is that you have all of these layers. So this would be fed into a deep neural network and it has two jobs. So I said one, it has to recognize yes or no, classify, or it, it, we, just like we did with the uh, drone, yes or no, is there a, a solar panel in this image? And if so, there's a second task, and that is you have to segment. Segment where it is, show me where it is so I can get a sense of area. So it has to do two different things. So again, this classifier is trained where I've taken all these images. And first of all, I have to determine yes or no. And if, and if it identifies that yes, that there is a, a, a panel in this image, then it goes about segmenting it so you can identify area. Okay, and it was trained on hundreds of thousands of satellite images. And um, I said mainly determine the presence and also the size of, uh, you know, to, to, to create this database. And so uh, this shows an example of an original satellite image. And, and you can see here, the segmentation results. So again, if you look at the, um, you know, there's nothing there and there are panels on these. If you look at these, you can see where the model, again, I correctly identified that there's nothing there, but also learn to segment. It has to tell you where it is, where in this image are, are those panels. So deep learning is used to both classify and segment. Classification is used again to locate it and segmentation is used to estimate the size for the database, okay? And then um, you can see another example here using a satellite image, again, where, where it's showing you exactly where it believes the panels are and then segmenting, okay? But then lastly, as we wind up here, is that um, Deep Solar put together this uh, a website where you can play with the data. And I think it's brilliant. So let me just show you that really quick and I'm gonna open it up for questions. Uh, let me see if I can get over there. And I can even put this in, in chat if I need to. But here it is, this is the website. Uh, uh, right here, in fact, uh, oh, just one second. Let me see if I can put that in the chat for anyone who would like to play with it. Uh, uh, but what this is right here, again, this 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 has, I think it was one and a half million different installations is what it found. And you can go in as, again, as it's uh, the darker the color for the states of the density. And as you go in deeper, as you can see here, if you look at the different counties, uh, let me see where Santa Clara down here. So if you go into Santa Clara County, again, let me pull back out. So you can see this is the state. So within the state, the darker would be the county. So Fresno and, and some of these other places would, would have a lot. And then as you zoom in, you can get census track. And you can see as you roll over, let me get over here. Oops. As you roll over, you can see that corner, it tells you 1,000 homes, the population is for all of these different tracks. And so this is a building, it's the whole, the, the lower 48 states, all the contiguous United States, it's done this project on. So it's a great database and good for anyone investing in solar, wants to know the density of solar or how it's being used. I think it's just a brilliant project. It's very nicely done. And again, all of that is uh, using uh, uh, deep learning, computer vision, and all these different things. So it's a great use of uh, data science with the, uh, Energy. So uh, with that, we have about, what is it, about 10 minutes left. So I will uh, open it up, I guess, for any questions. Or Roger, I guess I can hand it back over to you and I, I will be here for, for uh, questions, you guys. I'll stop sharing with you, so if you wanna. Are you there? If you're, if you're speaking, can't hear you. Anthony, th thank you so much for that yeah. great presentation. This is Wade from Plug and Play. Uh, don't have a, a you know big question. Just uh, was around the 
structured versus unstructured data you mentioned earlier in your presentation and and you know the amount of projects that you see in the energy space whether it's in oil and gas or or utilities i was curious like which ones you know you you find more opportunities and or or which one's more challenging if you could just elaborate on that just as to kick it off i'm, I'm sure you know i see for some of our yeah, for structured versus unstructured that's right well, unstructured is infinitely more challenging because there's no, again, uh, structured is where you have, uh, I'm sorry, you said, I was thinking supervised versus unsupervised, structured versus unstructured. Uh, man, it depends. I, I would probably say unstructured may be a little bit more challenging. Uh, with structured data, you can do some feature engineering and clean the data. There's some other, you have a little bit more control with unstructured, you can't really do uh, most of that. So you're a little bit limited. The algorithms are a little bit more complicated. So uh, in terms of the two, but I would say the, Again, it may be a little biased, but I'd say maybe the more exciting problems might be the unstructured data, more the AI-ish problems. But uh, with uh, unstructured data, you do need um, a lot more data, though. That's the other thing. You would need a lot more data oftentimes with unstructured. Uh, but that would probably be what, what I would say. Structure might be slightly easy. I don't know if there's ever such thing as easy. It's all relative. But it might be a little bit easier in that you have a little bit more control of the data. But I do think some of the problems are very... Uh, um, uh, enticing and engrossing can kind of get lost in some of these AI problems, which are the uh, unstructured data problems. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Thanks, Anthony. Sure. I, um, I see some of our partners here, for example, from DCP Midstream, Sharon, you, you shared some uh, some of your cases uh, around data analytics, and you know I was, that's partly why I was curious to hear some uh, Anthony's feedback on it. I'm looking at one of the questions here from Jenny. Thank you, Jenny, for the question. Um, someone's saying, can you hear me? I'm not sure who that is. Is that, I'm not sure if that's you, Raju, but I can't hear you, Raju, if that is you. We can't hear you. Uh, uh, Jenny, let me see. Wow, Jenny, that's a great question. Um, I don't know any, any cases offhand. I'm sure there are some. Uh, if you would, uh, I would be surprised if Kaggle wouldn't have something up there uh, having to do with it. That's a great question. That would be a great, um, actually a great uh, uh, use case. Uh, that might've been a good example if I'd have thought of it maybe to, to bring with some of that, uh, some of those things. But that data is so new, but there might've been something similar, but that's a great, great question. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of data set regarding the pandemic and, and, and predictions and, and all those types of things. Um, uh, let me see. Uh, again, that's a structured data problem uh, using, for the most part, using the pandemic, depending on what you're trying to predict. Uh, but those are, uh, those would be great. Uh, like I said, a lot of problems are done with the pandemic, but I haven't seen anything with the wildfires. But again, uh, uh, it's relatively new and I haven't looked a lot, but that would be a great uh, example and use case. Great question. I've got like two questions. Like, do you think that a that using AI in data science is possible to implement in the energy sector? Do I think it's useful? Yeah, because like, it seems like when you perform one, because I feel like AI at this point, is like when, when you make a case for it, it seems like it requires like something that we don't have as of, it's not the, because I don't think their AI right now is as developed, I think, or I'm not too sure. Well, it depends what you're trying to do. It depends what your question is. I mean, I don't know. I mean, it really depends on what the question, the data set. Uh, how much never data mind. Yeah. All right, never mind then. All right, then I'll ask the second one. How does, sure. so you mentioned about operational efficiency. Mm -hmm. How does AI and data science help with that regard aspect? <laughs> well, it's, it's, we say it's monitoring the efficiency and so that it can learn in real time to make adjustments in order for, again, it depends what you're measuring, but it can make in real time adjustments in order to help efficiency, whether it has to do with renewables or, or gas or the use of some energy, it can monitor in real time to help in terms of the usage, how it's used, how it's distributed in, in, in terms of efficiency. So it's just more monitoring the use and, and the machine or the system and so that it can uh, be used more efficiently. So just monitor the efficiency of the machine, of other machines that make adjustments in that if there is any 
if there's any inefficiencies involved, got it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, it depends if, it's, if you're talking about production or if you're talking about distribution. I mean, it really depends. Yeah, oftentimes it's monitoring because it's, as we saw with the Google example, it's monitoring. So it can say, you know, this isn't very efficient. So it can, it, just like I mentioned earlier, as far as the smart home, it can say it's not very efficient right now to be using that because you have a lot of things on, or there's no reason to have the dryer or washing machine on at this time when it can maybe wash clothes overnight. Or that's what you know. Some so it can make some decisions to help in in in, in those ways so that you can be a little bit more efficient with usage. And I post. I think. Oh, sorry. I got. I get. I think I get the question now. But I think I got another question. I think it's a bit concerning that sure. distant AI. They let the AI handle all the data what happens if the server is down how can you handle that <laughs> like yeah. example like there's like a power outage somewhere and you did say that a lot of energy is required to handle all those data well that's a different yeah, question I mean, you'd, have, you'd have redundant i mean that's a different question that, uh, that's a devil that's a different question but uh, uh that's a different be, question I mean, entirely yes <laughs> No, but I mean a different question from data science. You're talking about if the server goes down, that's more redundancy and, and that, I mean, I'm talking about assuming that that isn't the case, but you're right. If you, there, there would be some things just like if your power went out in your home, there's certain, certain things that hopefully you'd have some backup or some redundancy or, um, you know, but that's a different question from, from data science or AI. That's more of a DevOps or, or, or data engineering question. Uh -huh. But thank you, those are good questions. Anthony, can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you now, Raju. You're back. Okay. <laughs> and I, switch, I don't know what. I switched to phone. Thank you uh, for chiming in by meanwhile. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. What I've done, uh, folks, I think uh, as we are coming, I think I, I want to answer that question which Jenny has because I have a couple of uh, inputs over there. I don't know if she's still there. Uh, but also what I've done is posted a couple of links. One for upcoming events. We have stopped a lot of events during COVID and different things, but we have some coming up in collaboration with Stanford, which we primarily do for Stanford, but if you are interested in some of the programs, and most of these are nice compact programs, for example, data science for three days, if you know basic Python, this is three days of compact learning, which can bring you to a great level of machine learning and data science. So just take a look at that. And also we would appreciate if you can fill up a one question survey, I think I've put that link as well. So if you click on that, uh, select the session and just put one, Answer mandatory question. That's it. And this one would love to really hear what your inputs are and how we can continuously improve. We do plan to make uh, more sessions along with plug and play and so on and so forth. So it would be great if you can take a few, few seconds and do that. While I go back to Jenny, I think the question from Jenny was, do you know of any use cases that ML, uh, we are using ML to uh, solve problems relating to wildfires and uh, pandemic? And I do know both of them actually. Uh, in case of the wildfires, I mean, I don't know if it's in production lights, but I know personally a couple of startups and I have one I'm involved personally, uh, where we are, that's called Drony Tech, uh, trying to come up with drones which have can cover acres and acres of uh, area through images and processing with humans and just walking and going around would be much, much challenging. Uh, it's not production lights, but there are a lot of research and product development happening, uh, this, which can be done. Uh, on the pandemic side, there are a lot of applications which are COVID related. Uh, Google for themselves has come up with a, a mechanism where you can uh, have apps which are created to partners where you can identify social distancing. And I'm sure you've seen tons of them where face mask is on or not, uh, social distancing is on or not. And from when you're getting in back to companies and offices, uh, automatic thermal uh, cameras which are checking your temperature and allowing and doing all of those sites. There are lots of those which are coming in uh, place to really help in this kind of scenarios. And I think um, that technology is trying to definitely try to do their part to help in that. So hopefully that touches a little bit of what Jenny, you were asking. Uh, there are a couple of points since the meeting is recording. Can I rewatch this? Just uh, that's from little water for internal. We'll check if we can post it out. You most likely will. Uh, we'll see which uh, channels which we can post. Uh, uh, most likely we'll put in our website somewhere. We'll do that. Um, thanks, Adrian. Uh, next question by Dinesh is, what are the biggest challenge that you came across which can domain specific from 
you came across which are domain specific from your experience i'm missing uh the question uh dinesh if you wanted to unmute and ask uh, i can make some sense but i hate to make some guesses yeah hi raj this is dinesh here yeah so yeah. my question is like what are the biggest challenges you know in this uh, energy sector which he faced from his experience so that's what i meant over there yeah. okay oh the challenges okay. in the, the challenges in energy yeah energy sector like uh, since you already worked in this right well right, i think so. well uh, i think there's a few things but i think the quantity of data is a big challenge i believe i, I think also the velocity and the, the data changes constantly unlike other models that can maybe train retrain once a week once a month once every six months it's constantly almost like amazonish where it has to be it's just constantly changing so i think that's a big part of it and the 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 number of um sensors you know whether they're in these smart homes or whether they're in in these remote way out there for some drilling or fracking or uh in uh, uh you know all over the place in 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 wells and is all of these sensors all of that is is a big beast is a challenge in terms of the amount of data all those things are the challenge the quantity and the variety i would say that is you have so many sources of data from a coffee pot all the way to a grid i mean they're all communicating so i think all of that is kind of a challenge uh, but it's a uh, it's a good thing it's an exciting time cuz cuz data is data i think i think data is beautiful so it's a good thing Okay, okay. Thank you, thank you. Sure. Oh, I, Anthony. Oh, and, um, yes. Roger, I think I already said that. Um, okay, so the meeting's recorded. So I wonder if I can rewatch it just to keep back up track. There are some things I'm a little concerned with. So I'm thinking if I could rewatch this one again. <laughs> yes, the session is recorded, and you can reach out to us, and we'll share that with you. Um, uh, where would I find that one? <laughs> you'll receive a follow-up email. with the link. Ah, got it. Thank you. All right. Well, again, Roger and Anthony, thanks so much for the session. Thank you everyone. Uh go JC um everyone who else who attended uh today and uh we look forward to getting some feedback from you as Roger mentioned. Uh we we tend to be able to do these sessions more if you get feedback from you and we're happy to maybe include some startups if you're interested. But uh we'll wrap it up here. Thank you and uh, enjoy the rest of the day. We'll keep in touch. Thanks Pete. Thank you very much. Thanks everyone. Thanks everyone. Have a nice day.